Uh, so my, the other day, my, my father was, um, he lives in Colorado. He lives in the mountains above uh, Denver, Boulder, that area. There's these huge sweeping mountains and then they go into the plains, which is very flat. So he's driving down from the mountains, very steep driving, uh, lots of fun growing up on these steep hills. Once it snows, you're basically like a sled in your car going down the hill. It's a, it's a real riot. Uh, unless you are afraid of going over the side, in which case it's not as much fun as you might think. Uh, so my mother was afraid, but I thought it was fun. And this is how it would go. Uh, so my dad is making his way down the mountain. He has four-wheel drive. Some people in two-wheel drive would attempt this. I had a two-wheel drive vehicle. And thus, we had no control whatsoever. We just hoped that we're not going to run into something on the way down the hill. And as my dad is going down the hill, there is a young, foolish man who is halfway stuck in the road now, and his, his wheels are off the side in the ditch, okay? Uh, and he's trying, he's spinning his wheels like crazy. You can smell the clutches going, which is what happens when you keep putting your foot right in that middle zone and the gas at the same time. It's not a good situation. Uh, most of the time, whenever you see this, what you do is you smugly think, I don't drive like that, and you drive right past, which is what my dad did. So he went to the side and he kept going. Uh, I, I've gotten every year, I would get stick, s stuck five or six times, and then you dig yourself out. This is a normal occurrence for driving up in the mountains during the winter. It's about a foot of snow. Uh, but for some reason, he got a little further down the road. He was late to work, but he really felt like I ought to go back and help that young man. So he turned the car around and came back. And the young man was in the exact same spot, spinning the wheels, going nowhere. And so uh, dad got out of the vehicle and said, can I help you? And now the young man looks not excited to see my father, but as if this is a sign that he really has failed so badly now that this man will have to help me. <laughs> He's not happy. He says, oh, fine. Okay. <laughs> fine. Says, well, can I can I try to drive it a bit and see if we can rock it rock it out of the spot that it's stuck in, which is what you normally try to do. So he began to to try to do this, and it wasn't really working. And so uh, Dad said, well, listen, uh, let's purposely drive the car further into the ditch for the moment, just so it's out of the road, so that somebody doesn't accidentally hit it coming down this road. So and you can come back with a shovel later, which is how you really get your car out of the ditch: is you take shovels and dig and dig and dig. And then suddenly it'll come out. And you can come back later and dig it out. And so the young man agreed. And uh, literally, after they had pushed it into the bank, uh, a matter of seconds later, another car came flying over the bend way too fast and swiped right by that spot and into the ditch right next to him. <laughs> so that, in fact, if he had been in that spot moments before, he would be certainly dead, okay? And suddenly, the whole world's perception of what had just happened changed. This man who had annoyingly come along to help, this other young man stuck in the snow, that person who he was skeptical about, who was embarrassed that he came over, suddenly it was like, thank you, sir, for saving my life, <laughs> okay? My dad drove him home. He was so chatty. And thank you, thank you again for coming by. I really appreciate it. And that was, that was really nice of you. The whole situation changed because suddenly somebody realized what a gift was. Someone realized what it meant to receive something. They didn't understand the value of that before. And in so many ways, that's kind of like how we can view Christmas. The, the nature of this season eludes us. I mean, kind of like Guy Fox and kind of like Halloween, you know, there's a backstory to the whole thing. But at this point, it's just like candy and blowing things up and costumes. But what does it mean? And in the same way that my father saved that man, Christmas is God showing up just in time to save us from certain disaster. Christmas is God showing up just in time to save us from 
disaster. But we may not see that. We may not understand that. We might not really grasp what God has done for us. And until we do, it is just a bunch of traditions. When in actuality, it's an incredible gift. The most incredible gift. Your life given back to you. So let's start by considering how God steps down into our messy situation. We see this in verse 18. Uh, This is uh, Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, and you will find it on page 965, although there's no numbers on that page, so it's uh, directly after 966, I suppose, just directly before 966. Uh, Let's keep this handy with us. We want to understand what God is telling us And that requires that we keep our focus on his word. So let's take a look together at verse 18. God enters our mess. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, or was righteous, and yet did not want to expose her publicly, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But as he was considering these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. So uh, Mary is having this child, right, by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what Christians refer to, what we refer to as uh, the virgin birth. And it's the hardest thing, one of the hardest things to believe in the Bible. (laughs) When people read this and they say, give me a a break. (laughs) So why in the world would God take things this direction? We're going to look at it, but just in passing, I want us to think, okay, if it's plausible that God exists, if you look at the whole world and think, yeah, this is a plausible explanation for why we're here, then is God allowed to do something like this? Well, yes, he can do whatever he wants if he makes the rules. Now, we're going to look at why later on he chose to do this. But here's the plan. This woman is going to have a child by the power of the Spirit. But what happens? Well, Joseph hasn't been told, and he discovers that his bride-to-be is pregnant, okay? Um, and uh, th- this is uh, in the system here that they do, actually, you would, you would be kind of married. It was like a practice marriage for a year before you actually get married. It's kind of like dating, but a lot more serious, okay? You're, you're dating now, but you're actually, you're kind of married now. We just want to make sure this thing flies and in about a year's time, we'll sign all the papers for for real. So it's like a marriage, but without all the benefits of the marriage. And during this time, it looks like Mary is a cheater, right? It looks like the sort of thing that you might read in the Inquirer or the Globe. Uh, And even today, we would find what's going on here unacceptable. We have kind of a looser set of morals, but we still think it's wrong to cheat on somebody else, okay? If you're in a relationship, you don't go and cheat. So, and we get this, and it's it's wonderful gossip, right? But in this culture, it's far worse uh, what's going to happen if it turns out to be true. It's considered kind of like a life-destroying act for Mary. I mean, at the very worst, she might possibly die for this. That's unlikely here. But this is going to destroy any chance whatsoever that she'll have a normal marriage with somebody because they'll say, you're unfaithful. And it'll probably drive her, if true, this would drive her to uh, prostitution, the only way that she'll be able to uh, have a, a means to make a living. So this is not a wonderful thing going on in What do you guys think Mary is feeling at this moment? She's now trusted God, who said you're going to have a child by the Holy Spirit. And there is a child, in fact. And then one day her husband says, you cheater. What do you think that she actually is feeling? A deep, deep sense of shame, even though she's done nothing wrong. 
For some of you, it might have had the unhappy experience of being in prison, hopefully for something you didn't do, right? But even just being in that vicinity, whether you've done nothing wrong, it's, you feel shame. You feel great shame for being there. And this is what's going on with Mary. But you know what's strange about all this? Is that this is God's plan. <laughs> this is actually what he's intending to do. God is intending to have his perfect son born into what? Shame. People will look at this from the outside, not know anything about Jesus, not know anything about the God of the Bible, and they will laugh, they will mock, they won't bother looking into it, and they'll say those Christians are idiots for believing that. And that's exactly what many people do, by the way. <laughs> and still to this day, there's a document from very early on that documents that actually we've got everything wrong. Those Christians have everything wrong, and there was just an inappropriate relationship uh, well, it's claimed in this document from a soldier. A soldier came by, and this is why Jesus was born. Why would God allow his perfect son to be considered an illegitimate child and the product of a shameful relationship? That's the question that we have to ask. Imagine if the UK royalty went through something like this with the heir to the throne the way that we would be up in arms over that. And this is God's plan? Why would God cover his son from birth in shame? Well, I think it's a picture of God taking our own brokenness upon himself right from birth. I think it's a picture of God saying, I am willing to get into your worst sins and to put them on myself so that you can be made right. And so even in God's very birth of, of his Savior, who is, who is God himself, born into this world, Jesus, he allows himself to be brought down not just to mankind's level, but to the very wickedest things that men do. He says, I, I'm willing to take that on. I'm willing to carry it. And that actually makes sense of a lot of things that happen. Jesus is born in a trough, remember? A place where animals eat. His lineage has lots of people who have had lots of colored bad decisions that they've made. Okay, harlots and prostitution, that's all in there. And uh, foreigners to the Israelite faith, that's all in there. God is saying, I'm willing to take the whole lot of your sin the whole lot, even the shame that surrounds it, I'm taking it upon myself. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 5.21 to see this in action a bit uh, and to think about this. P possibly. Yes, 2 Corinthians. Who put that in the notes? Um, 5.21. There it is. God made him, Jesus, God made Jesus, the one who had no sin, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God is taking on your personal brokenness. God is taking on your worst. He's taken that on in Christ. And that includes shame, deep, vile shame, that he would wear those things so that you don't have to wear them. Does that bring you comfort? Does that bring you joy this Christmas? I was thinking about during Christmas and on our birthdays, we have a tradition of giving gifts to one another. That tradition basically comes out of Christmas. Before this, you don't really see, at least in the Middle East, any sort of giving of gifts at all for on, on birthdays. It, it seems to have developed from the Christmas story, okay? And when you receive a gift on Christmas, why, what's the purpose of this? Is it so you can get one more thing to put in uh, to your houses 
uh, to use or whatever. Yes, it is, but it's also it's also about a statement. This is love to me. Okay, you you care about me. You've gone and gotten me this, and everybody knows when this goes wrong and you get something that doesn't fit for the person, and they go, "What? What is this?" Right? You you get this, and you say, "I I am loved." But what about God, who takes on the very worst of us so that we can be made well? This is the plan. Sometimes uh, people feel that God is absent from their life because their life is so broken and so messed up and so filled with uh, darkness and and shame. And, And God wants that very shame and that very brokenness to be put on his son. He's not absent at all. He wants to carry it away. All right, well, so continuing the plot line, notice uh, Joseph, he kind of has like this godly love and godly mercy for his spouse who he thinks is unfaithful. And and so um, he looks at her, right, and he says he's a just man and he's a righteous man. And because he's a righteous man, He doesn't want to humiliate her. He's going to put her away in secret. And he's thinking about things. He doesn't immediately go and act, okay? He's mulling things over, long enough, apparently, to go asleep and then have a dream in which God informs Joseph about the plans. And this is real mercy, actually. This is a great picture of mercy. I don't know if you've ever been crossed in a major way Uh, Most people, when they've been crossed, they immediately go to, I will have my revenge, okay? That's the way it works. And sometimes uh, this sort of thing has led to innocent people uh, being convicted of crimes, uh, some to capital punishment. And then only after we figure out, because they're in such a rush to get what they've lost back to get their vengeance. And we don't see anything like that here with Joseph. Joseph is saying, oh, It seems that my wife is in in the wrong here. Uh, I don't want to humiliate her. And and let me tell you what it would be if he chose to humiliate her. He would literally say, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. And then that would be it. She would be sent from his house, probably naked, humiliated. The word would be spread, and it could be very dangerous for her from that point on. And Joseph has mercy. And this this is the heart of God, and this is where he's at with us. Having given his law, he's merciful. And then he's slow to act. He's not moving fast. And so we have this God who would come down and bear all of our sins. And then we look at that God's mindset as represented by Joseph. And what it is, is it's this merciful mindset and this long suffering and and this not uh, not seeking vengeance. And it's, it's, it's different from what we think of God, isn't it? He's not just ready to sit there and zap us for doing what's wrong. He's gracious. And it's a good thing for Joseph too, right? Because it turns out God had more to say on this matter. Christmas is God showing up just in time to save us from our disaster. Let's consider now how God has planned to save right uh, from the beginning. God has planned to save, and we see this in verse 20. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. He will save his people from their sins. So God says, well, in fact, this child is from the Holy Spirit. And the language there in the original uh, text would indicate that this uh, child is not born from the normal relationship between a man or a woman and not born at all from intercourse. It's more like the Spirit is working somehow to produce this child on his, his own means. And this child is going to be born apart from a man at all. Um, why did God do that? Well, we're going we're gonna to take a look at that in a minute. But then God s- says, I-, I have a name for this child. And the name is Jesus, which means God saves. 
That's what Jesus means. God saves. Not this man will save. God saves. And we get a hint. It's maybe the first of hints about who uh, this man is that is named God, God emphatic. God himself will save and not someone else. And so we have this picture. God will come down to our worst we've just seen. God will take that shame upon himself. And then God is going to deliver. And we get a further idea about what will be delivered from. He will save us from our sins. Everybody's favorite word. He will save us from our sins. Uh, most people are not excited, to be honest, to be saved from their sins. In, in quite the same way that the young man who looks at my father and says, oh my goodness, it's kind of obvious that I've messed up. We're not so happy to hear that we'll be saved, in particular, from our sins. What? Is that really necessary? I've got this under control. I'm just going to keep spinning the tires and help to get out of this ditch. Uh, the Jewish people during this time were waiting a savior, but the savior that they hoped for was not going to save them from their sins. He was just going to, you know, be a warlord to get rid of all the bad guys that were currently dwelling in their lives. That, that's what they were hoping for. Save us by uh, getting rid of those Romans, those pesky Romans, and then declare us what good people we are. God says, I have come to save my people from their sins. And it's a rich word. The, Im the, uh, the imagery of this word salvation is, is uh, in the Old Testament, this is what it is. There is a huge army coming against people who can't possibly fight them. They're going to lose. They're going to be enslaved. And the Savior comes to defeat that army and rescue the people and bring them out of darkness. And so the picture is this. Sin has enslaved us. Sin has beaten us down. Sin has hurt us. And we cannot get out. We're enslaved to our egos. We're enslaved to living for self. We're enslaved to the mistakes that we've made we can't get out, and Jesus now is going to come and bear all that on himself, and he's going to deliver us. Well, we might respond, well, I have minor mistakes. I, I can admit I wasn't myself one day and for just a moment did something that I regret, but I've done some good too, and everything is fine, and, and in a lot of senses, that's kind of like an alcoholic telling you why they don't really have a problem. <laughs> you know, I, yes, last night I did get plastered out of my mind. And when I was plastered, I did look over at you and begin to weep and say, I have a real problem. But now that I'm getting a little bit more sober, I don't have any problem whatsoever. I've got this in the bag. Don't you worry. I'll take care of it myself. That's the way we treat our sins. We minimize it. We put it aside, we say, no big deal, I can take care of it, and we have no control over it whatsoever. And everyone who looks at us says, no, man, you really, you really need help. Like somebody outside of you has got to help you with this. But you say, well, I haven't done the bad sins, the really bad ones. We can always find a sin worse than the ones that we've done. Perhaps we haven't murdered anybody, that's good. Perhaps we haven't done the sort of drugs that we have other, we know other people who have done those heavy duty drugs. Perhaps we're really nice to our spouses and we know somebody who screams at them. So I'm better than they, we say. But in a lot of ways, actually, we've just taken all of the irrespectable sins, the ones that nobody likes, and we've said, I, I don't do those ones, but we have other sins. And should those sins become inappropriate, well, we may push those away, but we'll go ahead and get some other sins to make up for the ones that we've just pushed away. Or maybe we'll find a really good closet to hide them in. When I was younger, uh, my parents would insist that my room would not look like it had been hit by a hurricane at least once a week. And this is the way I lived my life. Basically, I would walk around with whatever was in my hands, and then when I was tired of that thing being in my hand, I would just drop it wherever wherever I was, you know, so if I was over here, down, down it goes, what, and this, this led to a house full of trash, 
And my room was the epitome of this trash, you see. And then my parents would say, please, please clean, clean up this room, just as my wife now says, OK? And so what would I do back when I was a kid? <laughs> what I would do is I would take all these, I never, ever cleaned it, really. I would take all the junk, and I would push it to the nearest hidden area, OK? <laughs> so that might be under the bed. That might be the area that I was supposed to keep my shoes in. They had the nice door, so nobody could open it. Hopefully, my parents won't be smart enough to open the door and see all that mess. Under the carpet was a great spot. Even better, between the mattress, OK? There's a lot of space between the mattresses. This is the way we treat our sin. It's no big deal. I don't have a problem. I can shove it all in the drawers. It will fit. And it's all in an effort to think that we can do it. But it doesn't really work. And this is why we need a Savior. This is why we need a Savior. Now, God knows what we're like. And so from the very beginning, he's planned to save us. Look at verse 23. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. God with us. So this is prophecy. It's actually prophecy of 700 years before Jesus. But you could go back further and find even more prophecy. Actually, the beginning of the Bible, in the first three pages, God says that there's going to be war between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Well, seed is usually a term that is for uh, male, um, what the male contributes to a child. But here it's just talking about the woman. So there's going to be a woman's seed, and this woman's seed is going to rise up and crush the adversary, the devil. So the very first page of the Bible talks about how there is going to be some sort of miraculous birth, and that God is going to use this to defeat evil. This particular passage where it talks about the virgin will be with child, um, the background is this. God had said to David, your offspring are going to be, uh, one of your offspring is going to rule forever in, in peace and justice. He's going to rule and bring peace to the entire world. But then what happened is David's kids would, some of them did okay, and then some of them did really bad, but they all weren't good. They all weren't good enough. And, and there's a whole line of them that did really, really bad. It's because they have David's problems. Every child that David has has David's problems. And so eventually, this prophecy comes out that the virgin will be with child. And it's God saying, you know, men keep doing men things. They keep messing everything up. They keep not saving. They keep coming short. So I'm going to do something different. I'm going to come. And that's why we have the virgin birth. And what's the child's name? Emmanuel. God is with us. God is with us. When, uh, when I wasn't a Christian, I was terrified of the concept of God, okay? <laughs> because I thought, if, if God does exist, and I really hope that he doesn't, but if he does exist, and for some reason, he and I got too close. Like, I'm sure that lightning would come out from God, and I would just be Fried because I know who I am and I know what I've been doing. It's exactly the opposite. God has come to be with us. And what does that mean? It means I take your worst upon me. It means I'm here to save you. It means I'm here to carry you home. And this is the gift of Christmas. It's life. And in his presence, life forever. And you didn't ask for it, did you? But it is a good gift. Christmas is God showing up just in time to save us from disaster. Christmas is God showing up just in time to save us from disaster. And I think this morning what Jesus is asking us 
is, will you let me save you? Will you let me save you? Um, there are people that lifeguards cannot save. They're drowning, and the lifeguard can't save them. And the reason that the lifeguard can't save them is not because the lifeguard isn't strong enough. It's not because the lifeguard doesn't have enough information to save them. It's that when he goes or she goes in the water to pull this person out, that person is too busy trying to save themselves to let the lifeguard save them. They're trying so hard to stay above water. They're trying so hard to keep afloat. They're flailing their arms. Water's going in through their face. They can't stop. And the lifeguard can't get his arms around that person to save them. In fact, the lifeguard has been told to stay away from them, actually, because they will drown too, okay? You cannot be saved by Christ if you're busy trying to save yourself. You cannot be saved in so many worthless ways that society tells you, go find salvation. You, you cannot be saved by transcendental meditation. You cannot be saved by this thing or that thing that makes you feel better about your life. You cannot be saved by a pile of money that somehow tells you that you're going to be okay. You cannot be saved by saying, I've lived a good life. Oh, I've done better than most. You wouldn't judge me. You cannot be saved by pretending it's going to be okay. You must let Jesus save you. You must let him have your heart. How? Ask him. Jesus, save me. Save me. I can't get rid of this shame. I can't let go of this regret. I have a broken life. I need you to forgive me and I need you to take my sins away. That's the way you get saved, trusting in Jesus. That's the gift of Christmas. I hope you'll open it this Christmas. I hope you'll take it in. What about us who believe? Well, what happens is we trust Jesus for the gift, and then we never talk to him again. That's it. We're good. We're fine. Okay, Jesus, thank you for that gift. I'm going to go on living my life the way I live it, and I'm definitely not going to live desperate for you. Is that how we respond to this gift of salvation? No, this is the gift that we open every day. So it turns out that we were desperate for Jesus in the past, but tomorrow we'll be equally desperate. It hasn't changed a bit. The way that Paul describes it, it says, having begun in faith, are you now going to try to do this by your own strength? Is that, is, are you going to now do this by works? Is that what you're going to do? Is that going to work for you? No, no, we stay desperate to Christ. You know, the dangerous moment is when we begin to think that I have this together. I'm a pastor now. I have the answers. I know Greek. Good for you. That changes nothing. You need a Savior every day. Try this. Try waking up every day and thinking, I could royally mess up my entire life today. And that's what I would normally do without Jesus. So God, would you come and help me take away my sins? Help me to live for you today and help me to accept this gift of salvation that I am made right by faith. Transformative for your life. When you wake up one day saying, today is about me and my stuff, or you wake up another day saying, Jesus has died for me and I am desperate for him this day. So come and fill my life. Pray those things.